So this evening, we are going to have the opportunity to hear from Jericho. He's going to share some of his work. We're also going to have the opportunity to have some dialogue. And in the course of that dialogue, I'm sure Jericho will get a chance to share some uh, interesting details about his writing and life and wisdom and all that good stuff, right? I'll tell all my business. He's not telling all his business, so you, you heard it here first, folks. Um, not that this isn't being reported live. And <laughs> just an intimate, an intimate evening with friends. Um, so just to give you, a, a, again, a sense of how things are going to flow, I'm going to introduce Jericho and read his bio. Then after I read his bio, he's going to share his poetry. Then the two of us are going to chat a bit. I'm just going to ask him a few questions, and then I'm going to open it up to y'all, and then y'all can come in to the conversation. And after that, we'll have the opportunity to have Jericho sign some copies of his new work. So how does that sound? Uh, that, that thing is perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess we can just jump into things. I'm Charles Stevens. I am the executive director of the Counter Narrative Project. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm just really grateful to have this opportunity to partner with the Auburn Avenue Research Library. They do amazing work. Let's have a hand for Auburn Avenue Research Library. <laughs> And so when they reached out to me and asked if we would be interested in co-sponsoring this event and just uh, you know sharing space with Jericho, of course I jumped at it because I knew that this would be an incredible, incredible evening. So for Jericho, Jericho Brown is a recipient of a Winting Writers Award and fellowships from the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard and the National Endowment for the Arts. His poems have appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The New Republic, BuzzFeed, the Pushcart Prize Anthology, and the Best American Poetry. His first book, Please, won the American Book Award, and his second book, The New Testament, won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, and was named one of the best of the year by Library General, Cold Front, and the Academy of American Poets. His third collection of poetry, The Tradition, um, is by Copper Canyon. And he is an associate professor of English and creative writing at Emory University. Please join me in giving another hand for Jericho Brown. And as I shared, Jericho is going to delight us with some of his yeah. poetry. I'll, I'm going to stand up so y'all can see me. Is that OK? I'll just read from over there. Okay. <laughs> I won't read for a long time, I promise. <laughs> I'm not sure what the um I really don't know because I don't I don't watch. Hey, hi, y'all can hear me? I don't watch TV on this what is this Tuesday? Tuesday night. So I don't know what the show is that y'all are missing to be here, but I really appreciate it. <laughs> Oh, is it Jeopardy? <laughs> is Jeopardy like, I thought like Jeopardy was like a daytime show. It comes on at night? Yeah. Does Alex Trebek still do it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I heard this. Yeah. And he's still working through that? Yeah. God. It's a rough It's a rough <laughs> um, Where I'm from, we always began, no matter what we were beginning, Always begin with prayer, so I'll start with a poem that is also a prayer. Prayer of the backhanded, not the palm, not the pear tree switch, not the boomstick, nor the closest extension cord, not his braided belt, but God bless the back of my daddy's hand, which holding nothing tightly against me, and not wrapped in leather, eliminated the air between itself and my cheek. Make full this dimple cheek, unworthy of its unfisted print, and forgive my forgetting the love of a hand, hungry for reflex, a hand that took no thought of its target, like hail from a rhymed sky, involuntary, fast, but brutal in its bruising. Father, 
I bear the bridge of what might have been a broken nose. I lift to you what was a busted lip. Bless the boy who believes his best deeds lack intention, the mark of the beast. Bring back to life the son who glories in the sin of immediacy, calling it love, God. Save the man whose arm, like an angel's invisible wing, may fly backward in fury, whether or not his son stands near. Help me hold in place my blazing jaw, as I think to say, excuse me. You can have a seat. <laughs> I mean, unless you want to stand. I just figured you would wait for me to finish so you can sit down. So I just let you know I was finished. <laughs> Y'all didn't miss that, I ain't read but one poem so far. And y'all got half it. <coughs> Labor. I spent what light Saturday sent sway and learned to cuss, cutting grass for women kind enough to say they couldn't tell the damn difference between their mold lawns and the vacuum carts. Just before handing over a five dollar bill, rolled tighter than a joint and asking the end to change a few light bulbs. I called those women old because they wouldn't move out of a chair without my help or walk without a hand at the base of their backs. I called them old and they must have been. They're all dead now, dead and in the earth I once tended. The loneliest people have the earth to love and not one friend. Their own age, only mothers to baby them. And big sisters to boss them around. Women, you want to please and pray for the chance to say please to. I don't do that kind of work anymore. My job is to look at the childhood I hated and say, I once had something to do with my hands. <coughs> One of the things that I'm always trying to do when I'm writing poems is I'm trying to. Um, recover, reclaim, renew uh, some of the language that I heard growing up. Uh, for a long time, I lived in San Diego, California, I'm originally from Louisiana. After re living in Louisiana, I lived in Houston, Texas. So I was um, pretty much in the same radius of where I was born for a very long time in my life. And then I moved to San Diego, and I learned that I had an accent. <laughs> when I found that I had an accent, I also found out that people didn't understand me. Um, certain phrases and certain words that I would always use. Um, this poem is titled after one of those one of those phrases that I heard all the time growing up. Four a.m. in the morning. My mother grew morning glories that spilled onto the walkway toward her porch because she was a woman with land who showed as much by giving it color. She told me I could have whatever I worked for. That means she was an American. But she'd say it was because she believed in God. I am ashamed of America and confounded by God. I thank God for my citizenship in spite of the timer set on my life to write these words. I love my mother. I love black women who plant flowers as sheepish as their sons. By the time the rooms unfurl themselves for a few hours of light, the women who tend them are already at work. Blue. I'll never know who started the lie that we are lazy, but I'd love to wake that bastard up at 4 a.m. in the morning, toss him in a truck, and drive him under. God has every bus stop in America to see all those black folk waiting to go work for whatever they want. A house? A boy to keep the lawn cut? Some color in the yard? My God, we leave things green. Hero. Hero. She never knew one of us from another. So my brothers and I grew up fighting over our mother's mind. Like sun-colored suitors in a Greek myth, we were willing to do evil. We kept chocolate around our mouths. The last of her mother's lot, she cried at funerals, cried when she whipped me, she whipped me daily. I am most interested in people who declare gratitude for their childhood beatings. 
None of them took what my mother gave, waking us for school with the sharp slaps to our bare thighs. That side of the family is darker. I should be grateful, so I will be. No one on earth knows how many abortions happened before a woman risked her freedom by giving that risk a name, by taking it to breast. I don't know why I am alive now that I still cannot impress the woman who whipped me into being. I turned my mother into a grandmother. She thanks me by kissing my sons. Gratitude is black. Black as a hero returning from war to a country that banked on his death. Thank God. It can't get much darker than that. I'll read, a, um, I'll read another poem that makes use of one of those words that I was talking about. That word I used to say so easily and then I found out it wasn't a word at all. <laughs> that word is Neil. Do y'all know that word, Neil? I think I well, um, in a sense, it would be like, uh, hey, how you doing? How is your mama now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, they said to say goodnight and not goodbye. Unplug the TV when it rained. They hid money in mattresses, so to sleep on decisions. Some of their children were not their children. Some of their parents had no birthdays. They could sweat a cold out from you. They wake without an alarm telling them to. Even the short ones reached certain shells. Even the skinny cooked animals too quick to catch. And I don't care how ugly one of them arrived. That one got married to somebody fine. <laughs> they fed families with change and wiped their kitchens clean. Then another century came. People like me forgot their name. Um, another feature of this book is that um, it deals with some of the things that I've You know how you know things are bad and then you start, you go to a place like this, like a library, or you just go to Google. You don't even have to go to the library. If you get curious about how bad things are, things are worse than what you thought. Mm -hmm. So this poem was written after I found out um, about um, the very long list, found out about and was completely confounded by the very long list of people who have been, um, I should say, people who have supposedly committed suicide while in police custody. Um, it includes people like uh, Victor White III in Louisiana, who somehow managed to shoot himself in the back, in spite of having been patted down um, while handcuffed and sitting in the back of a police cruiser, shot himself in the back, or Jesus Suerta in uh, North Carolina, who after having been patted down while handcuffed on the walk from the police cruiser to the building where he was to be built, booked, shot himself in the back corner of his head. Uh, or Sandra Bland, who after a day of fighting for her life, um, um, in a cell, in a jail, where there is video of her in the cell up until the moment that she supposedly hangs herself with a trash bag. And this is the poem that, that comes from finding out about that long list of names. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head and I will not shoot myself in the back, and I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you, I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail or cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might, or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do. I promise you, cigarettes, or a piece of meat on which I choke 
I'm so broke, I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, more beautiful than a brand new shiny bullet fished from the folds of my brain. Three or four short ones. Let's short. Let's see how short they are. I am sick of your sadness, Jericho Brown, your blackness, your books. Sick of you laying me down so I forget how sick I am. I'm sick of your good looks, your debates, your concern, your determination to keep your butt pump, the little money you earn. I'm sick of you saying no when yes is as easy as a young man. But what would you say yes to every request, though you're as tired as anyone else yet consumed with a single diagnosis of health? I'm sick of your hurting. I see that you blew. You may be ugly, but that ain't new. Everyone you know is just as cracked. Everyone you love is as dark, or at least as black. And then I'll, I'll read one last poem. This poem's a, um, you know, one of, I'm not a poet that writes with an intention that I know what I'm going to write about. I sort of set out based on the sound and the rhythm and the the music of language, and I allow that to tell me what direction I'm going in, in terms of subject content and thematics. Um, but I always wanted to write a poem about this, so I'm so glad that I did. I love poetry so much, and the only thing that I can think, you know, there's only one thing that I love more than I love poems, more than I love poetry, and that's um, what was cuddling. So, <laughs> so I finally wrote a poem about cuddling. Stan. Peace on this planet, or guns going hot. We lay there together as if we were getting something done. It felt like planting a garden, or planning a meal for a people who are still good at feeding, or touching, or barely touching, not saying much, not adding anything. The cushion of it, the skin, and occasional sigh, all seemed like work worth Mastery. I'm sure somebody died while we made love. Somebody killed. Somebody black. I thought yet of holding you as a political act. I may as well have held myself. We didn't stand for one thought. Didn't do a damn thing. And though you left me, I'm glad we didn't. Thank y'all so much. Famous people are good at being famous. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's yeah. the job. Yeah, we have that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the job. Tell us about your writing process. Yeah. Tell us about the blank page or blank screen that you stare at and how you're able to get words on it. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the ways that I'm able to get words on it is that I don't allow it to terrify me. And one of the ways that I don't allow it to terrify me is that I'm always working the text. Um, before, there's always some backlog of text that I'm working with. Um, so I don't, I'm not under the impression that I have to sit down at the blank screen and make magic happen. I think the magic has already happened in my past. 
and I trust that anything I've done is going to come to fruition. I just didn't know what to do with it then because I didn't have the lived experience or I hadn't seen the art that would tell me what to do with it. So poems happen for me in one of three ways. One is the way that we would love to believe that poems happen for everyone. You know, you sit down, you write a poem, and it's in the New Yorker the next day. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and that happens if you've been reading and writing in a very disciplined fashion, that will happen more often, right? That, that you indeed will have a poem made whole that just comes to you. Do you follow? But I, it's dangerous for us to believe that things have to be that way or we're not the real thing. Um, nobody is Whitney Houston singing, I will always love you, even Whitney Houston. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like that had to happen in a different way every night. Y'all watch Whitney Houston on a singles tour singing I Will Always Love You every night. She was every night figuring it out. She would get to that part of that song and be like, okay, this is how I'm handle this thing. <laughs> I got to do it. This is what I'm gonna do. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's the first way that I will write a poem sometime. The second way that many of us are writing poems, and which in which I too write poems, which might be a little different from a, a lot of you, is you write, you get a line. You're like, oh, that's my line. So I know that's gonna be something right now. So you get a line, you write the line down, and then you push. And what happens to many of us is we write down that first line and we're like, okay, that's good. And then we write down the second line, and we're like, all right, that's happening. And then we start looking in the sky. That's the third line. <laughs> like we believe that God will send down the third line. Do you know what I mean? And I think what the reason why I'm different is because I have no idea what the second line said, and I don't care what the third line is going to say. I write lines based on the sound of things. So if I have a line, I was on the phone with a friend today, um, and we were talking about the possibility of having braces when we were growing up, and how in my family that was absolutely laughable. Like, I would see kids with braces and be like, what are you? Do you know what I mean? Like, how is this possible? Do you know how much this costs? You know what I'm saying? And he told me that in order to get braces, his family cleaned a church. Um, but the sentence he said is, I love the way it sounds. Um, my family cleaned a church so I could afford braces. So, you know, that sounds good to me. That's a line. I was like, well, you're gonna, he's a poet. So I was like, you know, I will take that from you. <laughs> I will make the magic happen, so you might want to get on that, right? <laughs> and so, um, but if I have a line like that, I don't think that my next line is necessarily a story about braces. I just know that my next line sounds like that line, and the line after that sounds like that line, right? So if I get to the point where I'm saying like, some, I mean, really, really nonsensical things, like I will write lines, write lines to say fire truck, bam, bam, boom, boom, goop, because it sounds good to me and gets me to the next line. And because I'm not stressed out about the making of a poem. I believe I'm a poet and it will happen when it needs to happen. When I look back at that mess, that's exactly what I have. And that's what I have to turn. If I want to make something make sense, I make that make sense. So that's the first two ways. The third way, I know I'm taking a long time, but I'm telling you all the truth. The third way that I make poems is that I make use of what I have that hasn't worked in the past because I don't believe anything is dead. You know, Alice Walker has that book, um, Anything We Love Can Be Saved. And when she wrote that book, I was still in this position of my life where I believe what people say. I'm not like this anymore. But I think, you know, if I've had any successes in my life, it's because I was foolish enough to believe everything anybody said in church on Sunday. Do y'all know what I mean? Like, I just thought it was true. Dumb, dumb, dumb. Anyway, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, I, I literally was, look, any cliche you could give me, I was like, oh, mm. Do you know what I mean? So I believed it and I would like to live my life by it. Like, so anyway, um, there's this, uh, there are lines, this book, this new book has lines, part of the reason why I love this book more than anything is that it has lines that are as old as from 2004. The reason I know is because in 2004 somebody stole a computer and I had to start over. And I always tell people my bullets is on that other computer. So. <laughs> So it had, it had, you know, and I literally printed every line that I ever wrote that had not worked in a poem, printed all these poems that had failed, that needed revising, and I just cut them up. I didn't care that I was cutting them up. 
and I ended up with a phrase on one slip of paper and a whole sentence on another. And I made some really um, random, arbitrary decisions. So for instance, the reason why, um, there are two, if you've read the book already, you will know I read both poems today, I think, um, Four Day in the Morning and Hero, which are both poems about my mother. Those poems happened because I looked at lines going back 20 something years, and I said, every line that's got something about my mama in it, I'm gonna put in one room. That's what I did. Now, some of those lines were written in 04, some in 07, some in 11, some, do y'all see what I mean? And I started putting things together because they look like they go together, because they feel good. I still have a mess. Once you put a bunch of stuff together, you still end up with a mess. Another thing I do in order to make a mess, people will say things here today, like my friend said this thing I told you about earlier today. From Monday to Saturday, if you say something to me, or if I get a line, I put it in the notes of my iPhone if I like the way it sounds. On Sunday, I dump that into a Word document. I don't, and I say, here's my poem. I don't trip out. You follow what I mean? I know it don't make sense. Somebody said something on Monday, somebody said on something else on Wednesday, I thought of something on Thursday. Of course it doesn't make any sense. But when you have a mess of text on the page, you can then begin to ask that mess questions. And so because, and this is what we do, this is what human beings do with anything. If y'all see two people across the way talking to each other, you immediately and automatically imagine what they're saying to each other. People like to call you nosy for doing that. But that's actually just how folk are. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you see a painting, I mean, it could be a completely abstract painting or a completely concrete painting. What we say when we see a painting is, oh, this is about, that's what we start doing in our heads. It's literal paint on a canvas. This is about? It's about ink. Do you understand what I mean? So if you have a mess of text on the page, what would you do if a five-year-old, and you're teaching a workshop, or you're teaching poetry to kids, and a five-year-old had a mess of text that had really great lines on it, like, my parents cleaned the church so I could afford to have braces. Do you see what I'm saying? You don't just tell the kid, well, this line don't have nothing to do with that line, so this don't make sense, bye. You, you help the kid fix it. And so you have to be tender with yourself. You have to be gentle with yourself. You have to give yourself time. You have to ask the text questions. Who is your speaker? What is your occasion? Why are you so angry right here? Why is this tone different from this tone? This is the work that I'm doing when I'm making poems. But I don't deal with blank pages. I deal with all this stuff. And I know, the other thing is, you will notice, I mean, I, I probably just ruined poetry for everybody. But any poem you, you really love that's been written, you will notice more and more that m much of the poems that you love, if you really look at them, they've been made by way of juxtaposition and pastiche and just sliding things together that at first seem to have nothing to do with each other, but can begin to when the reader sees them together. That's how I make poem. We find ourselves in... I answered that question a long time. <laughs> we find ourselves in, I think, what many would describe as a, as a pretty terrible, troublesome time, politically, socially, and yet there's still beautiful art that's being made. There's still... Black folks are still creating despite, and then maybe that's always been the case for, for artists. And I was wondering if you could just speak to what it means to be a black writer in this moment. What does it mean for you to have the platform that you have and the voice that you have in this moment that we currently exist in? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's going to be different for every black writer, but I'll say what I was trying to do with this book that became the reason why I know I know that we are, I know that we have been and continue to be at risk in horrendous ways. Um, I was blessed, I mean fortunate enough when I moved here to have a yard, which is something I wanted to have for a long time. I didn't even know this was something I really wanted. But then when I got a yard, man, I just, I just really grew my life into it. Now part of this has to do with the fact that I'm from an agrarian family. My, my, my father, to provide for us, cut yards, literally. Like, that's how we ate. So when I got out of school, I didn't go to, like, the rehearsal or the practice or the meeting. I got on the back of a truck, and I worked till the sun came down, you know? And we cut yards, we um, cleaned um, flower beds, 
hedges, we planted a lot of beds, we trimmed hedges. Like, I know how to do all that stuff. So when I had a yard, I was able to do that for myself or to hire somebody and get mad that they ain't do it right. Do you understand what I mean? Um, and I, I remember very distinctly having, having the very privileged feeling of turning into my driveway and thinking, ooh, that's pretty. Like looking at the yard, like, ooh, that's pretty, you know? And I, um, and so I started writing these poems, these really pastoral poems that are about flowers, right? So juxtaposed to that flower, that ooh, that's pretty, right? Juxtaposed to that flower, that thing of beauty, which, by the way, is a thing that black people, in spite of our imaginations, even about each other, right? That black people have handed down generation after generation. There are black people all over this world, and particularly in the South, who are interested in the fact that their yard looks pretty. For the sake of pretty. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Not, not planting greens, beans, tomatoes, potatoes. It's not like that. It's like, I want that tree there because it's going to bloom at this time and that's going to be so beautiful. That that has value to black folk. Do you know what I'm saying? So I had this idea that I would take the image of the flower and I would take the image of a black man. And there's something that happens when I say flower, for instance, right? Like, if I say flower, we get an image, but everyone in this room might have a different one. Because I get a rose, you get a dahlia, you get, I don't know what you get, chrysanthemum? Like, everybody gets, y'all follow what I'm saying? Everybody gets a different flower, you get a lily, right? But I think the same thing happens if you take the image of a black man. If you say black man, what do you see? Do you know what I mean? And everybody in this room is going to see something else, right? And so I kept wondering what would happen if I take flowers and I just suppose them with black men, right? And are we able to then see black men in a different way? And are we able to see flowers in a different way? Do we have a different understanding of those two things? Do I have a different, ultimately, do I have a different understanding of those two things? Like, can I be aware of my own obsession with my yard? Do you understand what I'm, as a black man in this country? So I'm saying all that to say that when I think about what I do, I give everything I can give to beauty. And because I give everything I can give to beauty, the thing I make is going to be complete black. Because I'm black. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like I can't excise or erase that from anything I do. So if you give everything you do to beauty, and the thing you make is completely black, it's going to include all the joys of blackness, but it's also going to include all the pressures of blackness that come to being in this nation at this time, or in this nation at any time. Black people have had to be here. You follow me? So that's, sort of, that's how I see the work that I'm doing. Does that make sense? You know, I always knew I wanted to be a writer, uh, but I didn't know how to go about that. And I had this sense, um, I would look at pictures of writers on the back of their books, so I had this sense that in order to be a writer, I would have to do something first, you know, and then I would go be a writer, right? Like that there was this magical land. You, were, you had to be sort of, you had to be over 70, you had to be white, you had to have a white beard, and then, then yeah, yeah, then you could be, then you were a, you looked like a writer, do you know what I'm saying? Um, and then that began to change for me. That began to change for me um, when I went to school and I learned about other writers other than the ones I could find on my own in the library when I was growing up. One of the things I did, I had this fellowship that took me to Emory the summer after my sophomore year in college. I was 19 years old and I met, um, I met a man named Rudolph Bird, and, um, who was the director of African American Studies at the time. And many other things, many of you know Rudolph Bird's work. And um, he saw me and saw that I was, I, mean, I just wish I could make the face he used to make when he would look at me. You just know. 
He was like, he was quite a character. Yeah, yeah. He, would, he would just look at me like I needed help and that was too bad. <laughs> You know, he would look at me with all of the tenderness, but with all of the pity, but also, like, but also like a good deal of shame. <laughs> like, what? Get it together. And he, and one day he simply told me, he said, "I want you to go to the library, and I want you to find this book by S. H. Hemphill. He had shown the Marlon T. Briggs Black is Black Ink. He had shown that in our class, and I was asking him about the poetry there and the people in the film." He's like, you need to go read that. So I went to the library, and I'll never forget. So some of you know the cover of ceremonies. There's like, as it's in building this other guy. Um, and I'll never forget reopening the book and reading it and feeling as if somebody was telling all of my business. Like, why are you telling my secrets? Like, why, like how dare you? You know what I mean? Um, but also feeling completely um, exhilarated by it and also having a feeling. So I had all of these emotions, you know, and the best way that I can describe for y'all all the emotions I had, I kept changing my position in which I was, I was sitting at a table in the library and I, I had to answer for who I was because if I read where people could walk by, I would be afraid that they could see the cover. And if I read with my back to them, I would be afraid that they would see the word. And that changed my entire life, you know? Um, and it led to me being the, I mean, trying to be the honest poet that I need to be. You know, my job is to tell the truth, which is six him feel, you know, if he did anything, he just told the damn truth all the time, you know? Which made him a very difficult person to be with back here. Um, and maybe makes me a difficult person to be with too. So, yeah, so that's my answer to that six him feel question. Thank you for that. Why don't we, why don't we open it up for discussion? Uh, questions from the audience, thank you. Or reactions, perhaps. Thank you. Thank you. Completes the um, next part of the book show. Um, can you talk about Cakewalk? On yes. page 70? Yes. I can read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, walk. My man swears his HIV is better than mine, that his has in it a little gold, something he can spend if he ever gets old, claims mine is full of lead, S slow down, slows you down, he tells me, looking over his shoulder, but I keep my eyes on his behind, say my HIV is just fine, practical like pennies, like copper, it can conduct electricity, keep the heat on or shock you. It works hard, earns as much as my smile. So um, one of the things that I was, I sort of mentioned this when I was thinking about black men and flowers. I was, I'm thinking about communities of black people throughout this book, and I hope that's evident, that I'm thinking about communities of black people and communities of black people that are often forgotten. Or, that, or communities of black people where we assume what their lives are like. Um, so this question is sort of, I think, at least positing this assumption that people with, with HIV aren't in love or can't fall in love or can't feel joy or can't have a moment of happiness or, do you know what I mean? And often, what, often in our education of people about, to, about uh, education to people about HIV, um, we're not able to, we're not able to also let them know, you know, folk go to the grocery store, they eat sandwiches, you know, their hearts beat, they breathe. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And so over and over again in these poems, I'm sort of trying in my own way to fight against what I think of as assumptions about various kinds of black folk. And there's desire, too, which I think is really important, right? Like, I, love, I actually like the part of this poem where the speaker says, you know, I keep my eyes on his behind, which seemed to move nobody in this room. I thought that was like, oh, I was really excited to say, I got to say, I had a guy wrote that for five hours. I was like, oh, you <laughs> know, Jericho talking. Other reactions? I remember once in another meeting, we were talking about 
the role of poetry in public health, and you had this really brilliant idea that's always stuck with me, which is that when we talk about a treatment plan for someone that for someone that um, gets an HIV diagnosis, they get a treatment plan, or you get used to in the context of uh, the clinical setting. Mm -hmm. And the treatment plan is usually about like the medications and support system and case management and like all these kinds of things. But you were like, well, why can't poetry be a part of that? And I thought that would be revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Like, what would it look like, especially in the context of um, here in Atlanta? Like, what would it look like if poetry can also? I mean, because for many of us, art is healing. Poetry is healing. Uh, I think for many of us, in some of our moments of intense despair, you know, we turn to art, we turn to literature. I know I've turned to poetry at times, reading the work of people I admire. And we recognize that there is a healing value to, to art, to poetry, then what would it look like if we integrated it more in, in some of those contexts? So I would really admire that. Um, other questions or reactions for your some of your influences? Yeah, it's hard to narrow down. You know, um... You can say me if you want to. Sue <laughs> <laughs> so is just trying to see you. <laughs> there, there's, there's him and, you know, when people say who are your influences, I always make a little angry because I immediately think um, Stevie Wonder. Like, you know, where would art be without like Stevie Wonder? And <laughs> well, people want me to say poets, and I really do like, I mean, like, all poets are like, I just think Stevie Wonder is really, I cannot believe, like, one person made off those songs. Like, it actually sometimes makes me a little angry. You know what I'm saying? I think about the fact that um, certain people did certain things, and I'm like, wow, I got a lot of work to do. You know what I mean? Um, so, you know, Stevie Wonder is a great lyricist and a great artist, a great musician. Um, I really like I really like the, the work of Titus Kapar, who's a visual artist. I have a poem that's dedicated to one of his works in the book. It's called Correspondence. Um, I'm really interested in, um, I mean, you know, there are all kinds of poets that it's like hard to narrow it down. There are so many poets I love. Um, I love Langston Hughes. I do love Emily Dickinson. I love um, Sylvia Plath, I love Terrence Hayes, I love Louise Glick, I love Gwendolyn Brooks, I love Lucille Clifton. I mean, Lucille Clifton has everything to do with me thinking about how to make a short poem happen. Um, and one of the things that I was thinking about when I was talking about including a poem in a, tr a treatment plan is that if something is short enough, people will read it, you know. People will stop each other on the street. People who don't even know each other will stop each other on the street and say, what does your t-shirt say? And that's okay. Have y'all noticed that? It's actually much easier than saying hello and getting a hello back. <laughs> Seriously, but if somebody has like text on their t-shirt, they will stop and they you read it and you chuckle and y'all have a human moment and you go on about your lives. You know what I'm saying? And I think there is something still in us that sees a short piece of text. And we're like, you know what? This ain't gonna take so long. So let me do it. Do you follow what I mean? Um, so I'm really interested in poets that make use of the sort of briefest moment and make much of it. And that has a lot to do with my love for Lisa Clifton. She's a good poet. Y'all should read all of Lisa Clifton. I also wonder if sometimes we make assumptions about who reads poetry and who doesn't, or who would enjoy poetry. I mean, I know we don't always think about, I don't think we always think about black kids when we think about who could love poetry. And then I think sometimes, at least the way that I was taught poetry in, in high school, for example, was always in a very like depoliticized, apolitical. So you, you know, we learn about links and views, but it's in a very like apolitical way. Like we're not learning about the context in which he's writing and mm -hmm. the, the larger ideas that he's grappling mm -hmm. with, you know, and, and that kind of thing. It's like let's just see what are the words on the page, and it's very sort of formalist sense. Yeah, and that's yeah. really that's particularly important when thinking about views because he's writing literally has to change. There was a time in this country people don't know this about links and views. Links and views. Uh, became a victim of the Red Scare. He had to testify in front of the Senate Committee on Un-American Activities, and for a long time, um, he couldn't sell his work. You know, Langston Hughes found a way to live off of his poems. He, he didn't go work at a university or anything else. Like he, would, he worked on the road giving readings and doing talks like this one. 
and he made that amount, and he worked selling his poems to magazines and getting things published. And it's the reason, part of the reason why, I mean, he was also an ambitious writer, but it's part of the reason why he wrote so many kinds of things. He needed to write so many kinds of things to make a living. So he wrote poems, he wrote plays, he wrote novels. Right? He has an autobiography. Do you follow what I'm saying? Um, and so that political moment in Hughes' life led to a different kind of poems because he needed to assimilate in certain ways to keep making money before he turned again to doing some very, um, very revolutionary kind of, of writing. How do, you, how do you navigate that tension between, okay, I gotta eat, I gotta pay bills, but I also wanna write and tell the truth. Do you ever self-censor? Do you ever find yourself in this moment of, the white gatekeepers won't like this poem, so I'm not gonna tell this story. Like, I need to write something that I know can get published in this place, or like, how do you navigate the institutional pressures of being a working artist and simultaneously remain true to who you are? Well, you know, there are different, there are all kinds of gatekeepers and all of them ain't white. And you know, there are all kinds of gates that you might want to enter. Um, one of my early, one of my earliest publications that I'm still most proud of, um, Nikki Giovanni published a book of the 100 best, the 101, because she, she didn't want to stop, the 101 best African-American poems. And I have a poem in that book. And um, because she's somebody who really cares about young black writers, and she's somebody who reads and knows what's going on. Whenever she's been one of the most supportive people in my career. Like many of the places I've been to because Nikki Giovanni made a call out of nowhere. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, so, you know, that's a gatekeeper. She's showing her white gatekeeper. Do you know what I mean? And she's certainly supportive of me doing whatever I'm doing that supports a certain kind of resistance. You follow what I mean? So I don't, there's a way, I mean, I understood, I understand where wealth resides in this nation, but I also don't have this idea that my value is determined by some capitalist model. I don't know why I don't, because I know most people do. But I, I think because of how I think about my grammar, like, I, like you know, if our value is about how much money we can make, if our value is about how many, how much, if your human value is attached to how many funds you have, what does that say about your grammar? Do you know what I mean? So for me, that's that on that. You know what I mean? So um, I'm not saying I don't like money and nice things. I do. She was like you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I went and got it. Right. No, seriously. I mean, this it's a good point. Like I went and got it. I went, I, I saw the shoes, I was like, those. And I took them to the register. Do you know what I mean? I tried them on. <laughs> and then I took them to the register. Do you know what I mean? I just I just went and got the shoes. Like I didn't start adding, I didn't check to see what was in that account. Like I didn't do that when I bought these shoes. You know what well, I mean? So let me let me try it a different way. So the poet that doesn't know how he's gonna pay his rent or her rent by the first, um, who is like looking at their account and it's a negative account, it, it's a, the checking account's in the negative, and they wanna write and they wanna create, but they are struggling. What advice would you give to that, to that artist? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what advice I would not give to that artist. First, I'm not gonna tell that artist to censor him or herself because doing that, you're not going to write any good poems. If you're not writing what's important to you, your poems are not going to be good. You have to follow your obsessions. You have to be, um, you have to be writing about that which is in the back of your head that you didn't know you really cared about. And if that's about class, or if that's about race, or if that's about resistance, then that needs to come out. And your best poems, I mean, Essex Hinsville actually said this, right? When he won the NBA, he had been rejected for the NBA year after year after year. And he won the NBA when he was writing his gayest poems. You see what I'm saying? Like before that, he could not win the thing. So that, I mean, so my advice is to write your heart out. I mean, that's the best advice I, give, I can give anybody if they have all the money or none at all. I mean, the, the other, it seems easy for me to say because things have gone well for me, so I'm not pretending that's not the case. At the same time, I still have to write my poems. If you don't win any prize ever and you're a poet, you still have to write your poems. And if you win 
every prize there is you could ever win, you still have to write your poem. You still have to stare in front of the computer and tell the damn truth. And that's not going to change for you just because you win some prizes. I mean, it's not, hopefully it won't change for me. I don't see why I would stop telling the truth. Your poem, Bullet Points, um, it reminded me of the situation of, of sitting down to write poems about something, like something in uh, current events, um, something in the news struck me and I felt like I had to write that into a poem. Um, but what I'm wondering is, have you ever had a time when you like you were staring at a massive text and a poem started to come up out of it or a topic presented itself to you and you wanted to pursue that. Have you ever had a time that the topic, once you realized what the poem was about, that that intimidated you? That it, um, like you found yourself struggling to know what to say about it or how you felt about it or anything like that? Yes, I mean, uh, you know, it's, just not easy. But again, I'm much more interested in finding out what I have to say than knowing what I have to say going in. Mm -hmm. No matter how much it may seem like it, I don't write poems about the time I blank. I don't sit down and say, the time I first made love, made love, here, here's the poem. It's the first time I drove a car, here's the poem. What, what I do instead is, I'll start with a line that leads to another line that leads to another line, and then I say something that I didn't expect to say. And that's the moment when I know I'm in poem land. I'm in poem land when I'm saying things that I didn't understand that I believed before I said them. Do you understand what I mean? And that's where the poem is. So for me, if I were to start with a news event, I wouldn't be concerned that I only wrote blue lines and didn't have anything else to say about the news event because whatever I start with isn't where I'm going to go. Do you follow what I mean? Like I don't, I almost immediately, I know that the thing that triggers the poem isn't what the poem is going to be about, you know? That poem, bullet points that you mentioned, in many ways is a poem about my mom more than it's a poem about anything. Um, it's a poem about climate change. But if I, if I weren't willing, hold on a second, I'm gonna show you what I mean. So the poem starts with the contemporary situation. I will not shoot myself in the, in the head. I will not shoot myself in the back. And I will not hang myself in the trash bag. And if I do, I promise you I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive, drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carpets more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in which is really what's at issue to me. I mean, what, what I really, I mean, you know, I didn't realize this is what I really think about. But what I really think about is that when the police tell these people's mothers that they have committed suicide, their mothers have to deal with that. Do you see what I mean? And yes, this, this poem is about the issue of the police, the problem of the police, but it's also about what happens to a mother Right? And once I know that, that takes me to the next things, right? When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do. I promise you cigarette smoke or a piece of meat on which I choke or so broke. I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worse. None of that is about the police. You see what I'm saying? I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, that cop killed you. He took me from us and left my body, which is no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crime and more beautiful than the new bullet fish from the folds of my brain. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, so for me, I start with the thing, and while I'm writing about it, I'm always looking for the other thing. 
there's got to be something else that deepens it for me. Is is my answer to you? So would you say that you're you're looking for the opportunity to translate the political into the person? Well, or I'm not. No, I wouldn't say that, but that might make it easier for you to make the leap. But for me, I'm looking for the opportunity to leave whatever I'm beginning with. So here's what I mean by that. I might start with my mama, like writing some lines about my mama, and then say a political thing and realize, oh, that's where I'm going, right? I might start with a pebble, right? Pebbles are nice, they're pretty. You follow what I'm saying? But I'm writing poetry when that writing about the pebble leads to the time I beat up a kid in the third grade. None of that is political per se. Yeah. Do you follow what I mean? If you, well, that's all that's like. But yeah, <laughs> so I, that's how I think of it. Do you have a particular approach to endings? Um, I think about what I said earlier in the poem at the beginning, and I think of ways to get back to it, but not in the same way. How do I enlarge the place that I started? Or how do I make more narrow the place where I started? Um, and so I'd like to make a sort of associative or subconscious move backward through the poem. Yes? Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering, when you were going through all of your lines uh, from the previous years, did you find any lines, did you find many lines that you disagreed with at this point in your life? No, I mean, the truth is when I write a line, I don't think I disagree with it. I think what I do is I write the line and I think, I mean, excuse my language, this is what I think. I think, oh shit, that must be what I think. Because I wrote it without thinking about it. <laughs> do you know what I mean? From years ago, like, things that, things that you wrote years ago that you felt that way, and you revisit them and you put them once about your mother in a pile of Oh yeah, oh I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, I think I still feel like the one of the reasons why those lines are still around is because I was convicted by them in some way. And they're still they're still part of the basis of how I live my life now, in spite of the fact that they didn't make it into a poem then, you know. How many left do you have in line? I have two, three zipper bags. So I put them all in like freezer bags, you know? And I have some there in the basement. <laughs> if y'all would have came over, y'all know Jure Holder, the great American playwright who's here now. Hey, Jure. Um, so, yeah, if you would have come to my house while this book was being written, you would have just seen slivers of paper all over the floor and all over the wall. So nobody could come over to my house. <laughs> it's a crazy time, man. And, um, you know, after I finished, packed everything up and I put it in Ziploc bags and I took them back downstairs. And then, you know, I'll use them again. But I have a word file too, so it's not like they're just there. It's just easier to see on the floor. Some people use um, cork boards and they put them on the wall and for some reason I like the floor. The problem is, you know, stuff gets out of place, but I like the floor. I like to look down and everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Can't open the door at all. <laughs> Any other questions? I like answering questions, yeah. Well, I'm really interested in um, the communities that writers put themselves in. I'm um, particularly interested in black women writers in like the 60s and 70s and how they were in community with their contemporaries. Are there um, any of your contemporaries that you feel that you're in very close communities with, and how does that sort of show up for you? Um, yeah, definitely big yes to that. Um, so I think there's a larger community of cultural workers and artists who are black, who see and know each other in certain ways, um, even just here in Atlanta, where that you, you don't see them all the time, but when you do, you know, here we go, we're here, hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm saying? But then for me, um, and I talk about this a lot in other things that I've written, there's just a long um, history of the community of poets being there for each other in ways that other artists' communities can't do. You know, if you write a poem and you want to call your poet friend at 2.30 in the morning and say, hey, I think I got something, your poet friend will get out of the bed and be like, well, let's see what you got. 
Do you know what I mean? Um, and I don't know if your paying afraid is going to come over your house and look at your pain. Do you, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So that I do think um, I had some really close friendships that were quite necessary when I was finish, finishing this last book because I, when I finished this book, I was really, um, when I was writing, I wrote most of this, I wrote, I would say, one third of this book from 2014 when my last book came out to 2017. And then things happened in 2017 and I started writing like a crazy person. I wrote most of this book, I guess two thirds of this book, from with the early drafts of poems from the from Thanksgiving of 2017 to Martin Luther King Day of 2018. The book came out April 2nd of 2019. Yeah, so I was like, I was pushing. What had happened before that is my editor had called me on the phone. He called me in August, he called me in September, and he called me in October. He kept saying, hey, I got a spot for you if you want a place in 2019. Hey, I got a spot for you. He kept calling to tell me, I kept telling him, I'm nowhere near a book, Michael. Leave me alone. You're making me nervous. I already feel bad because I don't have no poems. You know what I mean? And um, when I started writing really ridiculously crazy, like I was pulling over on the side of the road writing poems. I was writing poems in the notes of my iPhone. I was writing poems you know, in the bathroom. Like I just, for whatever reason, I could not stop. And I wasn't sleeping. It was a crazy. It was crazy. But it was also, you know, it was exhausting, but it was exhilarating because I was, I was like, I got poems. So there had to be people who were on call because I wasn't living right. Do you know what I mean? And those people were poets. One was the fiction writer Ayanna Mathis who wrote The Twelve Tribes of Hattie. Um, my very good friend, Philip e. Williams, um, who's a really great poet in his own right. He has a poem called Thief in the Interior. Um, the poets, Elmar Wilson, the poet Ricky Belanges, like a lot of those poets, they were just on like speed dial ready for me to collapse at any given moment because they were like happy for me, but also like, eat, bro, like, why would you eat? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Um, and then, you know, Malachi Black, um, Michael Shoemaker, I was calling people on the West Coast, you know, I would be up at 3 a.m., it would be doing, um, midnight, and I'd be like, hey, don't go to sleep yet, gotta read this. Do you know what I mean? I was so gr grateful for all of my friends on the West Coast at this point in my life. And um, I was also texting people because I was writing so much I thought I was gonna die. And I know that sounds crazy, but I really did because none of this seemed like anything I could do. So I kept thinking, oh, this is, you know, I'm from a certain people in a certain place at a certain time who went to a certain church. So I really did think, well, He's just using me, and then I'm gonna go. He's gonna take me out of here. Do y'all know what I'm saying? Like, I really, because it was, I mean, really, I was just like, hopefully I'll get to see it. Because I really didn't think I was gonna get, I thought the whole, I had put this whole, I guess in retrospect, maybe it was a conspiracy theory, but I had put this whole thing in my head, like, you know, these are really good poems that I'm proud of, and that's it. And maybe I don't get to see the book, because I had never written that much at one time. Sometime in February, I called my editor, and I said, um, is that spot in 2019 still open? This is in 2018. And he said, no. <laughs> I asked you like four times. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he's like, you think you have something now? And I was like, well, yeah. He was like, well, send me what you have and let me see. I sent it to him the next day. He called me on the phone. I was like, Jericho, you wrote all these poems. And he's all excited. He's great. Um, so he's a part of that community too, you know. Does that answer you? Yeah. You know, we have to do that. We really have to be there for each other. Like, it's real, you know? Like, you have to understand that nobody's gonna, I mean, in, in particular endeavors, you really have to see people and understand, it is my job to understand you because nobody else is going to, you know? What's the best advice you've ever gotten as a writer? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Nikki Giovanni um, would always say, never say no, um, which at the time was really good advice for me. Like I really needed to 
in many ways I was buttoned up and I held myself back in so many ways. And part of what she was saying is that you have to take the risk in the poem, but you also have to take the risk in life. You have to see things and experience things and do things. You have to have the experiences necessary to make the poems, you know? Um, so I think that was really an important piece of advice. Um, so I always tell people, um, never say no, look at you, Bonnie, <laughs> you know? Um, the, the, the thing that I would tell myself, though, if I could, was just uh, to calm down. You know, I was so worried when I was younger, and I, uh, um, I think this happens, I see this with my students a lot. I don't know if this is a, a generational thing, um, but they're way more worried than I was. They're like, they're like wound up really tight, and they have this expectation that they need to be brilliant artists who have whatever work they have in the middle of now. But do you know what I'm saying? Like they want, they don't understand. You know, my, I have, my students are overachievers in many ways that works out for them. I've had students who have poems. I teach underground, I teach graduate students. And I have students who have poems in the Best American Poetry. They have poems in Poetry Magazine. Do you know what I mean? They get notes back from the New Yorker like we almost took it. And so they feel a certain way about, and they're 20. Do you know what I'm saying? So they feel a certain way about, like, they want it now, like, now. Do you know what I mean? But we're not football players, we're not basketball players. We, we ain't even um, actors who need to stay fine. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, this, if you are interested in this, this is a long haul career. And you can't get better from Monday to Tuesday. You don't, like, when, when I talk about getting better, I'm not talking about how you improve your training camp, um, how you improve your jump shot during training camp. Do you understand what I mean? Like, I'm talking about a life of reflection, a life of reading, a life of writing, and really thinking about um, trying things that you haven't tried before on the page. So I think that's what I would tell myself, like to think, I mean, it's hard to tell 20 year olds because you know, when you're 20, you think people who are 30 are old. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so it's hard to. Yeah, it's just like if I'm not, if I haven't been in the New Yorker by this time I'm 30, I'm gonna kill, you know, like. These, and people yeah, are. are yes, made it, but yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's all capitalist model bullshit. Do you know what I mean? Everybody's interested in this wonder kid, everybody's interested in the child genius. Do you know what I'm saying? And the child genius is an exception. The child genius, and, and an exception that usually flames out and does some horrible stuff to himself before he hits 30. Do you understand, do you understand what I mean? So, I, and you know, so part of what I'm trying to relate to people, I'm on this big book tour and everybody wants to be a poet, which is great, but one of the things that I have to relate to people is to calm down and to slow down and to, you know, have, find opportunities to be with your work and to observe your identity and be serious about your identity. A lot of people want something that they don't want to work for than something that they work. You know, people think being a poet, I mean, it's it's literally again like the Whitney Houston model. Like they don't, like people have this idea that Beyonce, I don't know why, because Beyonce keeps telling y'all in every song and video. Right. But people have this, you know, people think that Beyonce is Beyonce because she's talented. But being talented really ain't got nobody nowhere ever. Do you know, like it's not enough? Talent is not, it's definitely not enough in the music industry. Do y'all understand what I mean? Like talent is not enough. Like that, that doesn't get you to the places where you want to be. What gets you to the places, the places where you want to be, no matter how talented you are, is discipline. It's really hard to talk to people about discipline and about observing and serving your own identity. Do you know what I mean? When, I've never, I don't know how this is my fate in life, but I've never slept next to Beyonce. Um, <laughs> can you believe it? But I know what Beyonce does when she gets up in the morning and gets in the shower. She does scales, because that's what singers do when they get up in the morning and get in the shower. Do you know what I'm saying? I know how to have a really good um, barbershop conversation about basketball, but I really don't want to talk to LeBron James about basketball. LeBron James has seen all the basketball games. Y'all think y'all can like look at like some clips of old school basketball games? 
Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Like, that's what it is to be a poet. Like, you want to be a poet, read some poems. <laughs> I'm really interested in people's attraction to poetry as readers. But then their attraction to poetry as poets, I'm sometimes surprised by. People are like, oh, I want to be a poet. And I'm like, what's your favorite poem? They're like, I don't like poems. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so you, get, you know, you just want the idea think, of the identity. But I think, you know, it's, it's, I do wonder sometimes. I mean, I think I remember being almost abused by poetry and literature, like it's punishment. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, we, don't I to, 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 we don't get to experience reading is pleasure, yeah. you know, always. And that's one of, I mean, one of the things I'm adamant about is, mm -hmm. is not treating literature and reading as, as punishment or mm -hmm. as something to be like <laughs> violent, it's not done toward you, but really finding joy and, and pleasure in it. Mm -hmm. Well, I just think with our approach to art needs to be like our, our approach to poetry should be our approach to any art. So, I'll say this first before I say this other thing. I want to say that my relationship to poetry is my relationship to trees. It is quite similar to my relationship to trees. And I don't you know everybody in this room has a tree. Everybody said Calvin, he told me the other day they don't have a tree. But y'all, if I say think of your tree, many of you immediately you're like, oh, there it is, your tree. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Like you got you got some tree you love somewhere. Y'all follow what I mean? I mean, if you ain't got a tree, you probably got a lake or a river, right? But you, you think of that tree, and that's how I think of poems. I don't look at the, a branch of that tree and say, well, in the context of the 19th century, this means, like, I don't do that to poems, you know? I don't explicate trees. I don't interpret trees, right? I know that they have feeling for me, and I trust that feeling, right? And anything that I do with a poem later that has to do with explication or with interpretation happens later, right? Part of the reason I'm able to do that is because I, as a poet, experience poems as often as I experience trees. So let me talk to you all about your relationship to music. Maybe not everyone's relationship to music, but many people in here, you have music on when you're driving down the street, you have music on if you're washing dishes, you have music on if you're in the shower. And this is what's interesting to me about, this is fascinates me about music. When you're listening, and now you really put it together, you know, when we were, when I was growing up, we had this thing called a radio, <laughs> and you would set the radio to the station you wanted based on the genre of music you believed you wanted to hear. I know y'all don't know anything about this. But y'all just make, y'all literally make playlists only of the music you know you like already. <laughs> so you don't have to sit through commercials or nothing. Do y'all know what I'm saying? When you're in your car and you're listening to music, even though you made a playlist, you don't hear all the songs. Every once in a while, I would say every nine minutes, which is, you know, that's three songs gone by already. You hear a song and suddenly you turn your, the seat of your car into a dance floor. You're like, oh, that's my, hey, what happened to the other song? Now, you would never, you would never say, I hate music. Because given the math, maybe you do. You only like one fourth of the songs out there that you like. You only like one fourth of the songs you like. So if you think about all of the music, you don't like no music. You understand what I'm saying? So part of the reason why we have that relationship to poetry, probably part of the reason why teachers have this relationship to poetry where they try to use it as violence against students is because they are not exposing themselves to poetry as much as they're exposing themselves to music or to trees. Do you understand? Like, y'all don't expect to like all the trees. You walk by trees all the time, but every once in a while you see one where you're like, oh, they go a tree. <laughs> The same thing for art. Many of you walk in spaces all the time where there's art. There's probably, we probably, just to get into this room, you probably pass all kinds of art objects. Every once in a while you pass an art object and you're like, who made that? But you can't have that with poetry if you're expecting to like it. You're not supposed to like everything. You need to be discerning about anything. 
Yeah, some of y'all go to the movies every weekend. You don't expect to like every movie. That don't mean you don't like movies. You understand what I'm saying? So our relationship to poems, our relationship to poetry has to be like, a, it's a love relationship. I mean, there's nothing like that visceral reaction that someone gets when listening to a poem, or reading a poem, rather, or language. I mean, I know for me, I didn't even know literature could do that until I started reading Toni Morrison mm -hmm. and coming across these passages and lines that would stop me in my tracks. And I have to reread it over and over again because it's so beautiful, it's painful. And once I realized that language could do that, mm -hmm. that you could write things that could just be stirring and earth shattering, tr transcendent joy, that's, that's when I knew that my, my life would be language. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I really want to instill that in other people. Like, and, I, and, I, and I love, that's what I love about your work, it's like it inspires a kind of, a, like a, a visceral reaction. Like you have to, you can't just listen to it passively, you have to like interact with it. And I think that's really what, what it's about, ultimately. Do we have any final questions before we wrap it up, or reactions? I'm gonna sign all of y'all's books if y'all do. <laughs> but she, the only way I'm gonna sign is if you buy it. <laughs> you have to buy one for me to sign. I can't sign your book if you don't buy it. <laughs> um, I know you talked a little bit about your writing process. Um, can we explore a little bit more? How how do you know exactly when a poem is finished? And what does that feeling feel like for you? Uh, in some respects, this has to do with um, two things that I've mentioned already. One is that something about the beginning of the poem being sing forward after you've written so many lines, something in the beginning seems to be reappearing in a different way. Um, so knowing that you're singing back to where you began lets me know, oh, I'm either closing or I'm close to an end. Um, and then the other thing is that community of poets, that family of poets that you can show your work to who will say, I don't know why you have these last five lines cut on because the, the, the end of your poem is five lines up from where you kept talking. Do you understand what I mean? Um, and the experience, I think the final thing is just the experience of reading a lot of poems and seeing how endings work helps you understand where your endings might be. Thank you. All right. Well, let's give another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is so nice. I live here, so I don't think all these people are going to be here. This is so nice. And he will be signing books in the back, so please get your copy of.